just would like to welcome all of you tonight, this afternoon, and this morning, wherever you are, to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting. Uh, Dr. Paul, mask stands for musculoskeletal active skills, and us is ultrasound, so it's like mask us. And so it's a play of words, uh, considering that we have to wear masks during this uh, COVID uh, times. And uh, it's a privilege that uh, we have with us one of our prominent uh, sonographer from Florida, from Sarasota. Is that correct place, uh, Dr. That's Paul? correct, Dr. DeCastro, thank you. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Paul was here maybe around was it seven years ago or six About years? About that, yeah. It was probably it was probably longer than that because I've lived in Florida uh, seven years and I was there I think probably eight or nine now. It's been time since flying, but I love the Philippines. It was a wonderful place. Wow, that's that's really a long time, and uh, he's always been very uh, visible in all conferences that talks about ultrasound anywhere in the U.S. in some parts of the world. And uh, he has written a lot of uh, papers on different uh, musculoskeletal uh, issues and written also uh, book chapters, especially in uh, what we consider to be our textbook, Bradham Physical Medicine Rehabilitation, where he wrote about the peripheral joint and soft tissue injection technique. So it's a privilege for us to welcome Dr. Paul Lento from uh, Florida. He's uh, he used to be part of the Temple University School of Medicine, and uh, I am so happy and privileged to welcome him tonight. And the rest of you here uh, from different parts of the world, I would like to welcome you to our mass photos on Zoom meeting. And uh, tonight, Dr. Paul Lento will talk about the normal sonographic elbow examination with uh, some pathology, as he has told me. So before we begin, before we finally turn over the uh, stage to him we'd like to request everyone to just let's just pause for a moment for a short prayer let's pray heavenly father we thank you for this beautiful day we thank you lord for providing us uh, this privilege of learning and learning from our colleagues from our friends from different parts of the world and we thank you for preserving our lives giving us good health and strength in spite of all these challenges of the covid can you lord protect each one of us as frontliners wherever we work May your grace and your angels uh, continue, Lord, to keep us safe from any harms and dangers. We ask, Lord, for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, good evening and welcome to our Mass Photos on Zoom. And let's welcome tonight Dr. Paul H. Lento, MD, MD RMSK, who will talk about the normal sonographic elbow examination. So, it's all yours, Dr. Paul. Well, thanks, Dr. DeCastro. As I've said to him and those on the call prior to this, this is an intimidating group. It's uh, international experts. I consider anyone on this call probably could give this talk. So I appreciate the opportunity and Dr. DeCastro asking me. Um, uh, one thing, I guess, all the bad things that COVID has brought, maybe internationally and as friends and colleagues, it's brought us a little bit closer that we can uh, discuss things like this and better our knowledge base. So I'm always interested in doing that and uh, so thank you for all attending wherever you are throughout the world and whatever time it might be. This talk probably only be about 35, 40 minutes. Um, and uh, Dr. DeCastro asked me to um, speak on normal sonographic elbow examination. I gave this talk a couple of years at the uh, American Academy of pm &R, And then also more recently here, there's a national course that I give this talk. And uh, so it, it, as we all know, um, sonography is a great, diagnostic tool, especially if putting it together with the history and physical examination. I find that nowadays, it, I think we lag here in the United States behind everybody else and using it. Now I feel like I don't know how in my day-to-day -day practice I'd be able to get by without using uh, ultrasound. So typical thing in the United States we have to do is nothing to disclose. Although I will disclose that when I give this talk, it's usually followed by 30 minutes of a hands-on demonstration, which I think makes it much easier to actually identify the structures, um, showing you where the ultrasound probe should be placed, the angle with which it's used. So 
as you can assume that uh, ultrasound is definitely a hands-on type of thing. I'll try to do my best to explain how I'm looking at some of these views, but uh, feel free and, and maybe uh, Dr. DeCastro can inter chime in if there's a question in the chat room that I'm not seeing. So uh, if you have a question as I go through this, uh, maybe at the end there'll be time for questions as well. So uh, just what we're gonna do is talk about uh, regional elbow anatomy and how, they, uh, how this appears in terms of the common structures, particularly the clinical structures that we see in a, a typical musculoskeletal practice, and then also develop a systematic use of it. Um, looking at each part of the elbow, we're gonna separate the elbow into quadrants, anterior, medial, posterior, and lateral. And then I'll just highlight some pitfalls that are out there, some things that I've noticed over the years of doing this, and then also reading some articles and little pearls that maybe you can get out of this, uh, hopefully that you can take back with your clinics uh, and treat your patients. So as we, we do for most things, <clears throat> we usually talk in the beginning of these talks of which transducer. Obviously the elbow is a very superficial structure, so using a linear array transducer is probably your go-to um, probe that you wanna use here. The higher the frequency, the better. And I used to do this with the person in a seated position so that I can compare to the opposite side which is really nice, particularly if you're looking at the lateral elbow and the common extensor origin. You can flip back and forth if you use what's called a prayer position. So basically having them sit like this where um, they can put their hands together and you can flip your probe from the lateral aspect uh, on either side. But over the past few years, I've really switched to more of a supine position. I think examining the elbow in a supine position can be really nice. It allows you to do some dynamic maneuvers, which may be a little harder to do if the person's in a sitting position. And in the United States, we, we bill for ultrasound based upon whether you do a focused examination or a complete examination. So I won't cover that here, but it's relevant in terms of how many structures you may be looking at versus maybe just a few to, to bill for a fo focused examination. And like most things with ultrasound, you can do dynamic maneuvers. You can have the patient move, you could look at their biceps tendon, um, a lot of, uh, mobility of the nerves, particularly the ulnar nerve. And we'll, we'll highlight some of that as, as this talk uh, goes on where we can use some dynamic maneuvers. So I'm gonna start the talk with looking at some of the common structures in the anterior elbow. And again, what we're gonna start is mostly with the elbow in extended position. Again, I have the patient in a supine position typically. And I usually like to start in the short axis view. And when you lay your probe down in the uh, distal humerus anteriorly near the antecubital fossa, the structures you're going to see most is going to be this very large uh, uh, muscular structures, kind of mixed hypoechoic, hyperechoic, typical for a muscle. We'll kind of describe it as a filet mignon, typically when we look at muscle. And that's the brachialis. It is not the biceps. Uh, your biceps is pretty tendinous at this point, as demonstrated in this model. If you flipped or reflect, uh, reflected this biceps tendon back, the brachialis muscle is the muscular structure that you're going to see here. The other important neurovascular relationship that I want to show you here is the brachial artery and the median nerve, which sits medial to the brachial artery. So the median nerve sitting uh, medial to the brachial artery. And then medial to that, you'll see the pronator teres. Now, the reason I bring this up is because later, I think this is an important anatomical relationship to understand that the pronator teres, not only being an entrapment site for the median nerve, as the median nerve goes distally, it's going to dive deep between the two heads of the pronator. But what I want you to pay attention to is the relationship of the pronator teres to the, brachial, to the brachial artery, as well as to the biceps tendon. So the biceps tendon is located right here. And you can use the pronator teres as a window to visualize the artery and then into the tendon. So as I go on to describe different views of the biceps tendon, I just want you to keep this close anatomical relationship of, you know, pronary teres to artery to tendon in this particular view. I'm going to play this video and you're going to see the median nerve here, this fascicular structure dive deep through the pronator teres and um, it'll run between the two heads of the pronator teres and then come out between the flexor digitorum profundus and the superficialis. One little pearl here is that the pronator teres can have different anatomical uh, heads. Um, so the the um, smaller head can be variable in size, shape, um, and so it can be a little bit tricky. The one pitfall is the brachialis also runs down here, so you don't want to confuse the pronator teres head 
to the brachialis. So it's just a, an entrapment point for the median nerve, and it can be a little bit tricky as you see that, that median nerve dive deep through the two heads of the, of the pronator teres. The relationship that frequently people will use here is a BAM relationship, and that basically means your biceps tendon to the brachial artery to the median nerve. So BAM is uh, typically the, the anatomical relationship that people have here. I mentioned the Lacertus fibrosis, not so much from a diagnostic standpoint. Um, it's, it's somewhat difficult to see. It has a close relationship to the basilic vein. So if you wanna look for it, if you identify the, the basilic vein in this area, sometimes you'll see some small connective tissue that's overlying the biceps and the, and the uh, forearm uh, flexors or the wrist flexors, I should say. But the, the thing that you wanna know about the Lacertus is that if it's present, it can often tether the biceps tendon in a complete tear. So it'll prevent the, the proximal portion of the biceps tendon from retracting back. So the Lacertus, can be the cause of a tendon in a complete tear to not retract back. So that's the clinical pearl with the Lacertus is that you would expect in a complete tear, much say like a long head proximal tear that the biceps tendon would retract, but the Lacertus in here prevents that from happening. Not so much though of a diagnostic um, uh, reasoning to be looking at for it, but just knowing what its function does. So I want to highlight a little bit about the anterior elbow joints before we move on to the tendons and other structures. The best way I find to visualize the uh, joints of the elbow are actually starting in long axis. If we start on the radial side, you'll see the capitellum with the overlying hyaline cartilage. Notice here the muscle of the brachialis, this very large kind of striated muscular structure, which we accustomed to looking at when we're seeing a muscle. So realize again, that the brachialis is the main structure that you're going to see in the distal um, humerus and just above the intercubital fossa. And the radial fossa is this fat-filled structure that'll house the radial head when the elbow is brought into flexion. Now, this is a good place to look for synovitis, loose bodies, um, other things that could be uh, the causation for joint diffusions, although we'll talk about where the best place to look for a joint diffusion would be this is a place that you can look for, but it's not the ideal location. If we slid our transducer a little bit more ulnarly in long axis, we'll then look at the coronoid fossa, which houses the, the, coin, the coronoid process of the ulna. And again, you have a little bit of a hyaline cartilage overlying the distal humerus here at the trochlea. So uh, again, you can look for a fluid or effusions here. You can look for any uh, hyaline irregularities gouty crystals, things that uh, may be clinically relevant here. Now you can rotate your probe in short axis, and this, this picture actually is nice. I, I took a copy of it because it's really well labeled, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. The hyaline cartilage here is hypoechoic, and we know that hy hyaline cartilage has this typical sonographic appearance. I, I will tell you, when I first started doing ultrasound, I used to think that everything was hypoechoic, was fluid, right? We see hypoechoic within the brachial artery, obviously fluid with blood. And I made a quick uh, mistake of understanding that hyaline cartilage was hypochoic. So trying to stick a needle in here and trying to tap this fluid when it's obviously hyaline cartilage was not so good for me and obviously not so good for the patient either. Um, but in short axis, you can see that great anatomical relationship of the brachialis muscle here in short axis now. And then the biceps tendon, the brachial artery, the median nerve and the pronator teres. And again, really just stressing the importance of the relationship of the pronator teres across to the artery, across the biceps tendon, because we're gonna use a window here looking across the medial arm into the biceps tendon called the pronator window that'll help us identify the biceps tendon. So let's look a little bit more in depth at the biceps tendon. So if we take this anterior short axis view, I think I just highlighted all the structures there, the brachial artery, the biceps tendon. We know that the tendon is superficial to the brachialis, but lateral to the artery. It actually, when I first was reading about elbow ultrasound, I did not realize, but the distal biceps tendon actually has two heads, just like it does proximally. It still maintains that anatomical relationship of a long and a short head. And there's no synovial sheath uh, about the distal biceps tendon. So unlike its proximal cousin, you really do not want to be diagnosing a tenosynovitis in a distal biceps tendon. There's no synovial sheath, but it does have a bicipital radial bursa. And like most bursas, 
you usually do not see this. It's only present in pathological states, and I'll show you an example of that. Now, the challenge with the biceps tendon, and sometimes I look foolish trying to demonstrate this in front of an audience, is that because it's a um, somewhat structure that runs posteriorly and obliquely, you're going to be met with a lot of anisotropy if you try to visualize it in short axis or in long axis, for that matter, through an anterior approach. So you will get this kind of, this is a long axis view, and you can see how the fibers are not as echogenic. This is due to anisotropy, the fact that the ultrasound beam is not hitting this at 90 degrees. So it can be quite challenging. If you're going to look at the biceps tendon, particularly in long axis, you actually have to do a lot of heel towing and putting a lot of pressure down on your distal probe to be able to identify that tendon in long axis. Um, and the reason that we develop other approaches for looking at the biceps tendon is because of this anisotropy and this oblique running, this kind of anterior to posterior obliquely oriented tendon. We have all these different approaches to identify the biceps tendon that we're going to highlight next. So the first one that's out there is something known as the medial or pronator window. Uh, this is my go-to type of um, examination when I want to look at the biceps tendon in long axis. So the way you do this is you place your elbow at 90 degrees. And when I teach uh, participants how to look uh, at the biceps tendon using the pronator window, the, I, I encourage them not even to look at the screen. I tell them just to put the probe on the medial humerus in a long axis and then slide the probe distally and as they get to the antecubital fossa, just slide a little bit anteriorly. And if you recall that I stressed the important relationship of the pronator teres to the artery, you'll see the biceps tendon on the other side of the artery. So as you slide this probe in this fashion, you will see cross section of the pronator teres, you'll see the long axis of the brachial artery, and then you'll see this nice echogenic fibular pattern of the biceps tendon inserting onto the radial tuberosity. Now this is a great way to avoid anisotropy. Now you're following the obliquity of that tendon as it's running anterior to posterior, and it looks really echogenic in a really nice way to visualize the biceps tendon. The nice thing too about this is you can add dynamic testing, meaning I can have the person pronate and supinate the wrist and I can look for the radial tuberosity moving and I can see whether this tendon is contiguous. So this would help identify a complete tear. Remember the Lacertus would tether some of this tendon and it may be difficult because the tendon still might be opposed to each other. But if I'm seeing only part of say the distal part of the tendon moving and the proximal portion is not, it makes me suspect that the person has a complete tear. So that's a nice dynamic maneuver to use in order to identify a complete tear. This is taken from Jay Smith's article in 2010 when this was published. Uh, this is Jay's hand, I can tell because it, it looks relatively muscular as Jay is. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he's a great guy and he's a, a wonderful uh, clinician and researcher at the Mayo. And um, basically, uh, he takes his probe, lays it long axis along the medial humerus, slides it distally, and then anteriorly. And this is kind of where the probe would be down the humerus. And as he slides it anteriorly, the first thing you're going to see is the artery and long axis, and then the biceps tendon juxtaposed to it on the other side of the artery. And this is why I was stressing that anatomical relationship of the pronator teres to the artery to the biceps tendon. Um, really helpful in understanding that kind of strange anatomy as we're insinating from a medial to lateral side and a great way to look at the biceps tendon in long axis. This is called the pronator window. And here's my little cartoon of how I suggest you know, people who, when they're first starting to do this, should really um, practice in terms of um, uh, sliding their probe. So you're gonna slide the probe down and then anteriorly into the antecubital fossa. Everyone wants to go onto the anterior aspect of the antecubital fossa to visualize the tendon, but you wanna try to you know, avoid the urge to slide your transducer over the antecubital fossa. It's more on the medial aspect of the antecubital fossa through the pronator teres that you'll really see this nice acoustic window. So that's pronator window. Now a little bit about the anatomy of the distal biceps. As I had mentioned, it actually has two different heads that maintain this separation 
um, at the distal uh, radius. And you can see these two heads, they actually can pronate and supinate upon each other. And you can have pathology or one or both of these tendons depending on the clinical scenario. This is a nice anatomical um, a picture of the insertion onto the radial tuberosity. The short head runs a little bit more distally and is a bit more superficial, whereas the long head is a bit more deep and inserts more proximal on the radial tuberosity. So they have two different insertion points onto the radial tuberosity. So the best way to identify the distal biceps tendon, I believe, in short axis might be the best way to identify these two heads is in short axis anteriorly. Now, again, remember I said that you're going to get some anisotropy, but you can use the anisotropy to your advantage. If you are following the tendon distally and you tend to lose it, just waggle your probe to and fro back and forth in this kind of motion. And sometimes you'll see these hypochoic tendons, which uh, represents the anisotropy. And you can two, see the two separate heads, probably the short head here and the long head here. And as I mentioned, they can slide independently of one another. Now, this structure is separated by an endotenon demonstrated here. This has been borne out in histiologic specimens that these two tendons are actually separated by this endotenon. And you can see that in that um, picture here where you see this small little endotenon septum, septum that's separating these two heads. So again, you can have pathology or one of both of these heads in relevant uh, clinical picture. So the other approach that we use, and, and just like anything, when you have multiple approaches, each of these are not ideal for one thing, but using them together, it helps you kind of get a gestalt overall of the biceps tendon. So we're gonna do a lateral approach here. Uh, we're gonna put the elbow at 90 degrees, fully supinated. So the hand will be like this, and the probe is gonna lay on the radial side of the elbow. And we're gonna insinate across the supinator and the wrist extensors, and you'll see a deep structure, tendinous structure, that is a very fibular and hyperechoic, looking like a tendon. And now we're parallel to the biceps tendon, but we're using a radial or lateral approach. This would be the cousin of the pronator window. So we, we looked at the pronator window on the medial side, but now you can look at the biceps tendon on the radial side or lateral side, and we're gonna insinate across the wrist extensors in the supinator and you'll see this nice fibular pattern. The nice thing about this too is you can do pronation and supination. You can move the radial head and have the person pronate and supinate and you can see the tendon slide back and forth. So as I run this video, you can actually see this nice tendon that's moving with pronation and supination of the radial head. Now the disadvantage of this view is that we do not see the insertion onto the radial tuberosity, it's posterior here. The other disadvantage is that you're going to get some acoustic shadowing from the fascia separating the wrist extensors from the uh, supinator, and you'll see this acoustic shadow move um, within the tendon. Now I know that's an artifact because as I, as I do pronation and supination, this shadow is not moving, it's staying right where it is. So if it was a tear, this would be discontinuous and it would actually be moving back and forth. So this is how we know that this is an artifact. Um, so the two disadvantages of this view is that we don't see the distal portion of the biceps tendon deep to the radial head, and we have a little bit of acoustic shadowing, which could fool some people. But quite honestly, I know that's how I, I often identify the biceps tendon because of this acoustic shadow. The only other thing I would pay attention to here is the brachialis is also down here. So if you pronate and supinate and the tendon doesn't move, you may actually be looking at the brachialis tendon. So that's just another little uh, word of wisdom there. Now the last approach we're gonna use when we're looking at the biceps tendon is the posterior approach, or some people refer to it as the cobra because you're gonna position the hand in pronation and you're gonna stick your probe between the radius and the ulna. And this is a, a good article if you're interested by Tagliafico published in radiology in 2015 just showing how you're gonna lay the probe. And basically what you're insinating is the distal biceps tendon as it inserts onto the posterior portion of the radius onto the radial tuberosity. What you're gonna see is you're gonna see a very large acoustic bony um, signal of the ulna. 
and then the radial tuberosity. And the distal biceps tendon is just this little beak that you'll see sticking out between the ulna and the radius. Now, this is a great place to, to consider looking for bicipital radial bursitis, particularly if you have to do an injection. Uh, injection back here is probably the safest approach. You can imagine trying to inject the elbow through the anterior aspect. You have the median nerve, brachial artery, and uh, can be a little bit precarious injecting it anteriorly. But if you do it through the back part of the elbow, uh, sliding your needle right through here, there's not much that's going to get you into trouble. There's a few perforating branches, the posterior neuroceus nerve, but again, usually that is not, uh, that does not really come into play here. So if you're looking at a procedural uh, type oriented view to use, the posterior approach would be my suggestion to use for that. Um, here's a video playing out that um, posterior window. Here's the ulna. And then this is the distal biceps tendon and the radial tuberosity. This particular patient has a, a tendinopathy with some hyperechoic calcific uh, hyperfoci within the tendon, as you see as I play this. Um, you can see these little punctate calcifications that pop up. Uh, this was a little bit more readily evident using an anterior short axis approach, but you can definitely see that as I pronate and supinate the radial tuberosity, this tendon uh, peaks its head in. And this may be why patients do develop bicipital radial bursitis because this tendon can get entrapped between the radial and, and uh, uh, proximal ulna, the radius and the proximal ulna. So maybe a cause of why people get bicipital radial bursitis. And here's an example of what this would look like. So the bicipital radial bursitis has a typical U-shaped picture. And Dr. Jacobson always talks about MRI correlation that frequently these will look like sarcomas or, or tumor-based type um, structures when they look at it with MR. But typically when he sees this, particularly under ultrasound, it has this very characteristic U-shaped look. And then when you do supination and pronation, you can actually see some, a little bit of the fluid peeking its head out as the biceps tendon is brought into pronation um, as you use that posterior window. And again, if you had to do an injection, this would be a nice way to just thread your needle into this area to inject whatever you wanted to do, whether it's PRP for a tendinopathy or whether it's for corticosteroid in the face of bursitis. So we're gonna turn our attention now, that was a, a lot just on the biceps tendon. We spent a large part of the talk so far just looking at the biceps tendon, which can be, as, as I mentioned, a challenging structure to see, but can be clinically relevant and looking at it. We're gonna talk about the medial elbow and we're gonna talk about the ulnar collateral ligament. Now remember that the ulnar collateral ligament has three bands to it, really, really clinically talking about the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. And the way you wanna do this is you wanna lay the elbow uh, in slight flexion um, and uh, look at the medial epicondyle. So you're gonna lay your transducer in long axis across the medial epicondyle down to the sublime tubercle of the ulna. And you'll see this nice, fibular tight structure. There's a little controversy as to whether people consider this and measuring this as the ulnar collateral ligament or just this fibular line. It depends on the article that you read. Uh, people take different measurements, but suffice to say, you really wanna see a nice compact fibular structure of the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. The one other thing to understand, particularly if you're not used to looking at the elbow, this is the humeral ulnar joint. It is not very robust. It is quite thin and just this small hypochoic cleft. But it's the structure that when you're stressing the elbow, you want to look at it. If this gaps open more than, say, about a millimeter, then it may be clinically relevant. And uh, uh, Nazarian and others have, have published studies, particularly in American baseball players, where pitchers actually have a little bit thicker ulnar collateral ligaments in their throwing arm than they do in their non-dominant arm, and their joint opens up about a millimeter is what they consider normal. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Jacobson always kids around that he's, he's a stickler. He's not big on measurements, but if you get a gestalt that the, the joint on this side is really gapping and you're seeing pathology within the ulnar collateral ligament, you don't see this nice fibular echo texture, you may be suspicious that the person has some ulnar collateral pathology. Now, the other clinical pearl I will tell you is that when stressing the elbow, and this is why I like putting the person in supine, I, I see some teenager uh, baseball players and athletes that are overhead uh, players, and you can just use a supine position. I frequently lay the elbow, the shoulder, in a bit of external rotation 
and I apply a little bit of valgus stress. And if you just lay the elbow down, gravity stress is usually adequate to see this joint open up. And you don't need to do a lot of, you know, it can be challenging trying to hold your probe, trying to hold the arm and doing some valgus stress in your office. So laying them down supine, you could just lay the probe on them with the shoulder externally rotated and gravity itself or just I put a little bit of pressure on their hand and just see what the medial joint space does and the humeral ulnar joint in this area and see if that cleft opens up. And here's a case, I, I did tell Dr. Castro I'd throw some pathology in there when I could. You could see this patient, here's the medial epicondyle, the ulna. This ulnar collateral ligament does not look fibular at all to me. It's got a little bit of a calcification or hyperechoic foci within it. Um, this does not look like a normal ulnar collateral ligament. And there's a little bit of fluid here, and you can also see the joint space. This looks definitely wider than a millimeter. Uh, and when I run this video, you can actually see fluid percolating up into the ulnar collateral ligament. And this was compatible with a full thickness tear of the, ulna, the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. And this patient was referred for surgical correction. Now, I highlight this. This was uh, published by Antonda as well as uh, Sikati. Sikati is a, a very prominent guy in Philadelphia. He sees a lot of uh, professional athletes. But this article, the reason I bring this, this is ulnar collateral ligament in youth baseball, and I don't know uh, throughout the world, but uh, we have a lot more kids playing baseball straight through all year long, and they tend to come in with a lot of shoulder and elbow injuries. And the point I want to make here is that the epiphysis in your 12-year-old uh, is, is still underdeveloped. And so the joint space here is going to look relatively large. It's not that small cleft. And it's not until you're about 16 through 18 that you develop the mature appearance of the ulnar collateral ligament with a small cleft. So you really need to pay attention to the age group that you're looking at, that the joint space may be a little bit wider because of the epiphysis that's present still being underdeveloped. And all this will mature later on between the ages of 16 and 18. So the common flexor origin, I think this is kind of the bread and butter that we start talking about when we're looking and patients are coming in clinical with a golfer's elbow or medial epicondylosis or tendinosis, however you want to refer to this. But typically you want to lay your transducer in a long axis view over the medial elbow and you'll see this nice bony echotexture of the medial epicondyle with these compact fibular structures of the common flexor origin that's made up of different structures such as the pronator teres and the FCR and others. And then you can see it has a somewhat close anatomical relationship to the ulnar collateral ligament. And I think the clinical feature here is that for our athletes with partial tears, other than addressing the kinetic chain, which is so important, we actually recommend strengthening of the pronators of the forearm and wrist flexors as that helps reinforce the ulnar collateral ligament. Now this is somewhat shorter than the common extensor origin and it's somewhat broader. Uh, you really want to look at the bony echotexture. This should be nice and smooth and not ragged when we see cases of epicondylosis, which here is a perfect case of a uh, golfer's elbow. This is a normal medial epicondyle with nice compact tendon here, no bony irregularity. Here is a case of, uh, this is actually a hand surgeon colleague of mine who was playing golf and really got into a lot of problems and couldn't really even hold an instrument anymore. You can see here this really uh, irregularity of the medial epicondyle. The tendon is very disorganized and thickened, and you can see these fluffy calcifications that have been laid down. He was very point tender. He had failed two steroid injections done elsewhere, and we ended up uh, doing some regenerative medicine and needling techniques with him, and he did quite well without any surgery uh, following this. So the other relevant median medial structure in the elbow is the ulnar nerve. And um, again, best way to identify this structure is in short axis. And I, I, I highlighted some numbers here, depending on who you read, it can be up to 10 millimeters squared in short axis. Typically above and below the elbow, it'll have that typical honeycomb picture. But one thing I would let you know is that when you are in the actual ulnar groove, it's gonna look relatively hypoechoic. That is just the way the ulnar nerve looks in the ulnar groove, and that is not pathologic. It's just the way it insinates in the posterior elbow. The way that I like to look at this is I'll bridge the medial epicondyle to the olecranon, and I'll identify the ulnar groove, and it'll have the overlying Osborne's ligament, which is right here. And then you'll also see the medial tricep 
which will be in this area. So if you see a hypoechoic mass that enters into the ulnar groove, that is the medial head of the tricep. And Osborne's ligament typically courses over this structure uh, that prevents the tethering or prevents the subluxation of the ulnar nerve in patients. Now the true cubital tunnel, I've done some reading on this and there's a lot of controversy, but it's felt to be between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris and you'll have the arcuate ligament or the arcade of Osborne as this uh, tethering structure that's over the ulnar nerve uh, more distally between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Here's a picture just showing the ulnar groove with the ulnar nerve that's relatively hypoechoic. Um, this is a video demonstrating following the ulnar nerve between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. So here are the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris with the typical honeycomb appearance of the ulnar nerve as you're going to the proximal forearm. So this is just following it out of the ulnar groove down into the actual cubital tunnel. Now, you can also look for notching if you rotate your probe long axis. So if we took the transducer and rotated it along the ulnar nerve, you'll see this nice railroad pattern of the ulnar nerve and you can look for notching or compression uh, that may be clinically relevant in cases that have patients with paresthesias or uh, hand weakness. So this is just a little cartoon slide of the anatomy that we were just looking at. I didn't cover the Arcata struthers, although this is a uh, fibro, uh, uh, fibro structure that tethers the ulnar nerve down and connects the medial head of the triceps to the bone, um, known as the arcade struther. It's a theoretical entrapment point. But down here is where you get into Osborne's ligament and the arcade of Osborne and the arcuate ligament as it goes into the actual cubital tunnel. And this is a nice article written by Andrews in the Journal of Orthopedics in 2018. So just a nice discussion of the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris with uh, the overlying ligaments that can be a compression site for the ulnar nerve through the cubital tunnel. So the nice thing about the ulnar nerve is you can also do with ultrasound dynamic stability tests. Now, we know that the ulnar nerve can sublux out of the ulnar groove in up to 50% of patients. And I'm sure you've had patients who come in complaining of snapping or they have paresthesias in their hand. We know that that can be a normal variant. So not everybody that snaps will have pathology. But the other thing to remember is that the medial head, as I had told you, can enter into the ulnar groove and can actually cause the ulnar nerve to sublux out. And it itself, the medial head of the tricep, can also snap out of the ulnar groove. So you may actually get two snaps. You may get snapping of the ulnar nerve and you may get snapping of the medial head as the elbow is brought into flexion. Some pearls about doing this maneuver though, is you really don't wanna put a lot of pressure on the transducer. I frequently have the person laying down or maybe laying supine and I'll lay the transducer, I'll float a lot of gel on the elbow and I'll just have them, I'll just lay the transducer softly on this area and do flexion extension. As they extend, the ulnar nerve will get back into the ulnar groove and then with flexion, you'll see the ulnar nerve pop out. But if you're putting too much pressure on the nerve, you can actually serve as an Osborne ligament and prevent them from subluxing, which is what you're looking for. So really try to avoid overpressure. And this is again why I like doing these exams in a supine position. One other thing to pay mind here is I'm gonna run this uh, video. You can see the ulnar nerve actually snapping out here and you can see the medial head of the tricep also insinuating itself into the ulnar groove. You see this thin hypoechoic structure. This is an Anconius epitrochlearis demonstrated in this picture. Some people feel that when this is present, it can also contribute to cubital tunnel syndrome and form a, a, a site of compression for the ulnar nerve. The best way to look for this is keeping the elbow extended. So, you know, don't flex the elbow looking for an anconius, actually keep the elbow extended. If you see any muscular structure over the ulnar nerve in the ulnar groove, that's probably an anomalous muscle, which is seen in about, they estimated about 15% of the population. So clinical pearls here are dynamic testing. Don't use too much pressure. Look for the medial head of the triceps and subluxation and also some anatomical variants with the Anconius epitrochlearis, which is a muscular variant. Now this was a case, uh, I, I, I'm assuming many of you out there do EMG or for those who don't, I was referred a patient in their 80s who came in with paresthesias and significant weakness in the hand and started to get a claw hand. Uh, this had occurred over a period of months, was having paresthesias in the ulnar fingers, 
Uh, I work closely with our hand and elbow surgeon, He's, and this patient was sent for an EMG. And the patient had a classic study for cubital tunnel. There was a significant drop of their conduction velocity across the elbow, and there was denervation within the FDP as well as in the hand interossei, the FDI. So I was suspicious that the person had cubital tunnel, but because the person was a bit older, I thought this was quite strange and it came on relatively suddenly and was getting worse quickly. So I pulled out the ultrasound and you know we're looking at a short axis view of the ulnar nerve, which is this small, relatively hypochoic, but outsizing that is this large hypochoic cystic structure that's appearing just to the uh, posterior aspect of the ulnar nerve. And when I play this video, you can see it has, it's relatively hypochoic, but has these lobulated appearance and it's sitting right next to the ulnar nerve. Um, and just proximal to this, although not shown on this, the ulnar nerve was quite dilated. So there's significant compression of the ulnar nerve um, at the elbow. And being that I'm in a surgical group, the hand surgeon texted me uh, a week later in the OR of what this looked like in the operating room. So what you're seeing is a, the medial elbow is here, the medial epicondyle up here. Here's the ulnar nerve and long axis. And then there's this large cystic looking structure that's putting pressure right up against. So every time this person bent their elbow, this thing was putting pressure up against the uh, ulnar nerve. And you can appreciate a little bit of the dilation uh, proximal to it uh, that would be related to the compression of this cyst. The interesting thing too on this patient, he also had a lipoma that was sitting over the ulnar nerve. I didn't include it in the slide, but he thought that that was the concern. The surgeon thought that was the concern that, uh, that there was a large lipoma that was sitting there. And it wasn't until I used the ultrasound that I actually saw the cystic structure that was uh, truly the culprit. So really nice how ultrasound can complement EMG in the office. Now this is a very weird case. This is a woman that came to see me just because she didn't have much pain, but she kept feeling snapping in her elbow. And I thought, well, this will be an open and closed case of just a ulnar nerve snapping. Well, she pointed to the anterior aspect of the elbow, and this is actually a short axis view of the brachialis tendon snapping over the trochlea. And you could see here that as she bends her elbow, this is the point of the trochlea, and that brachial tendon was snapping back and forth as she did flexion extension of the elbow. And other than reassurance, I didn't know what else to tell her because I don't think there would be any surgeon if she wasn't having pain that would go in and resect this trochlea to, uh, to help her with her symptoms. So we're gonna move to the posterior elbow. Uh, so far we've covered anterior medial uh, so far in this talk. Now the posterior elbow, I like examining, if I'm just doing a quick exam, just to look for say an effusion or um, you know, briefly looking at the tendon, I'll do the crab position where the patient's just sitting with their hand on their hip. And I just start with a long axis view. And when you do that, you'll see these nice fibular structure of the triceps tendon inserting onto the olecron, olecronon. Now it doesn't, it's much like the Achilles here. It just doesn't insert right on the tip. It actually has a pretty broad footprint and it can go anywhere from a centimeter to uh, from the tip of the olecronon and has this relatively broad insertion. And deep to that, you'll have the muscle. Some of this is medial head, some of it's uh, lateral head, but you'll see the olecranon fossa that's filled with posterior fat. Now this is the ideal place. If you're going to look for a joint effusion, um, this is the best place to look for a joint effusion. This would correlate with your posterior fat pad seen on your lateral radiograph. And it's also, I do the MRI arthrograms in our practice and it's my preferred place for doing an injection. Uh, so if you need to tap fluid, get fluid out of the elbow or do an injection in the elbow, I find the posterior fat pad is the best place to do your intraarticular injection. So best place to look for joint fluid in the elbow is in the posterior recess in the uh, olecranon fossa with the elbow flexed. And then you wanna confirm this in short axis as well. So this is a short axis view of the triceps tendon, you'll have this nice compact fibular approach. This is kind of how we're laying our transducer. Here's the medial head of the tricep and the lateral head. Uh, together, the longitudinal head and the lateral head form the conjoined tendon, uh, which is demonstrated here. This is an, a cadaveric specimen. So the main portion of the triceps tendon is actually made of the uh, lateral or superficial tendon. And these are comprised of the long and lateral muscles. So the triceps is somewhat complex. It's not as simple as just one big 
band of tissue, there's actually two separate heads. You'll have the uh, lateral or superficial head, and then you'll have the medial or deep head. And you can see this very small medial head of the tricep. This medial head of the tricep can insert as a muscular band. It may have a small tendon. Um, and the reason that's relevant is it can fool you when you're looking for complete tears of the triceps you will still see some tendon attached. It's kind of like the plantaris and the Achilles. Some people who have a complete Achilles tear will still have the plantaris attached and you'll think the person has a high grade partial tear. But really it's the, the, the smaller muscular uh, or tendinous head of the medial head that's inserting its, its separate insertion point onto the olecranon. So in review, you have the lateral or superficial muscle uh, tendon, which is composed of the long and lateral muscles. And then you have the medial or deep which is composed of the medial head of the tricep. Now, the other structure here is the olecranon bursa. Realize it's a potential space. It is not uh, gonna be seen or identified unless the person has pathology, and it's overlying the triceps tendon over the tip of the olecranon. And there's all different varieties of these olecranon bursas. I've seen hemorrhagic ones, infected ones, gouty ones. Uh, they can be chronic with a lot of bursal tissue, connected tissue, and very small amount of fluid. The nice thing with ultrasound is that you can find these little loculated pockets of fluid and tap them if you need to, if you're ruling out an infection, or if you're trying to get some corticosteroid or, or reducing inflammation. Now, here's a case of, uh, again, trying to show you some pathology, and this is why the, the anatomy of the triceps tendon is so important to understand. This is a... Um, a softball player who was actually on androgynous steroids, so he was quite muscular, and he went to catch a ball, and when his arm landed, he had an eccentric load to his triceps. His elbow was forced into flexion, and he felt a pop in the back part of his elbow near his olecranon, and he thought his triceps tendon was torn. He got very echomotic through his proximal forearm and some pain, but ironically, he was still able to do a dip. He could get on a chair and dip his whole body and uh, it was clinically suspicious to me, given his history, that he had a tear, but he was still functioning quite well. This is a short axis view of the muscles of his tricep and the tendon overlying it. And you could see in the distal one third, there's this large hypochoic defect before we get to the short axis view of the conjoint tendon or um, the majority of the triceps tendon. So I'm going to play that again. This is a short axis view. You see this large hypochoic defect. This looks like a complete tear to me. And when I looked at it in long axis, it also looked like a complete tear of the superficial head. But when I scanned over to the medial side of the elbow, you see this nice compact fibular structure. This is actually the medial head still attached to the olecranon. So I was, when I first was doing ultrasound, this confused me and I didn't know until later that the triceps tendon has this unique anatomy of having a fairly large robust lateral head and this smaller medial head that can fool you, particularly in cases of pathology. So we're gonna move now to the lateral elbow and the bread and butter structure over here, I think we're all used to seeing and certainly have treated patients with however you wanna to refer to this as either tennis elbow or lateral epicondylosis or tendinosis to the common extensor origin. Um, you wanna begin in a little bit of elbow flexion, maybe, maybe too much here demonstrated by this model, but you wanna lay your probe in long axis. This is the lateral epicondyle. Um, so nice acoustic landmark. And then you see these nice compact fibers of the common extensor origin, mostly made up of the extensor carpi radialis brevis. And between the radial head and the distal humerus, you'll see this little synovial fold or meniscus. And I actually think patients can get some symptoms here. They'll describe some popping, some pain. The pain is a little bit more distal than the uh, typical lateral epicondyle. And these patients can have some mechanical symptoms of snapping and popping. So the synovial fold or recess can get entrapped when the person's doing certain activities. Now, the other important structure here, now, oh, and again, you can look at this in short axis. So this is a short axis view. This white area is corresponding to the common extensor origin of the lateral epicondyle. So looking for that nice compact fibular structure of the extensor carpi radialis brevis and others here. Now, this is an example of somebody who has raging tennis elbow or lateral epicondylosis. The tendon is very disorganized and there's a, a significant amount of increased Doppler flow that we see with this particular case. In my experience, and I'll, I'll have others chime in maybe during the discussion, I, you know, I, if I see Doppler flow, I tend to think that that person is going to respond well to uh, needling 
techniques because I do think that these vessels probably are responsible for some nociception and doing some targeted injection to these vasculature seem to really be helpful for patients at least getting over some acute pain. And maybe that's when patients talk about they get steroid injections that maybe they have some temporary relief because the needling itself just from the injection may have given them some uh, benefit. And we could talk about that during the discussion. The one other structure to be mindful here when you're talking about the lateral elbow is the radial collateral ligament complex. Um, a clinical pearl here is that tennis elbow can be difficult to treat if there's pathology of the radial collateral ligament. So there's been studies suggesting that in patients with lateral epicondylar pain, if they have pathology of the radial collateral ligament, such as partial tears or complete tears, they are not gonna do well with conservative techniques such as therapy, injection-based therapy, things like that. So knowing where the radial collateral ligament is, is very important in clinical scenarios to make sure that if somebody has tennis elbow, that this may preclude them from having a successful outcome. But the lateral ligament complex is made up of the radial collateral ligament, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, we call it the luccal, or the annular ligament. The annular ligament in the adult population, not too clinically relevant, uh, more relevant in children with uh, nurse maid's elbow. But we'll take a look at these two structures uh, highlighted here. So the radial collateral ligament, similar look as the common extensor origin, you wanna lay your probe uh, across the lateral epicondyle. The best view to see it, this was just published I think this year, between 90 degrees and 120 degrees of elbow flexion will bring out your uh, radial collateral ligament the best. Um, and the clinical pearl here, and Jacobson's published this, is that the lower 50% of the lateral epicondyle, so the distal humerus, makes up the radial collateral ligament origin. So if you're doing any type of procedure, or if you're looking for pathology, this is tendinous on the superior or upper border of the lateral epicondyle. And then down here on the distal humerus, this will be the radial collateral ligament. So it can be difficult to distinguish between these two structures when you're just looking at it face value and long axis, but realize based on some cadaveric uh, dissection, the radial collateral ligament makes up about 50% of the lower half of the distal lateral humerus. So that's the clinical pearl there. The other thing that I find is because the radial collateral ligament has a little bit of a obliquely running approach, it can appear hypoechoic um, or relatively hypoechoic when you toggle or heel toe your probe. So this is just me looking at somebody with tennis elbow, but what I noticed is that the radial collateral, I was able to identify the radial collateral ligament. It's intact here, but as I just heel toe this, it helps me identify the origin and the insertion distally of the radial collateral ligament. So I could distinguish between what was tendon up here and what was ligament more down here as I can see the separation of fibers. So just using anisotropy to your advantage in that particular case can be helpful. The lateral ulnar collateral ligament can be a little bit tricky to identify. It's basically the same approach as the radial collateral ligament. The only difference you wanna do is as you follow the radial collateral ligament distally, just rotate your probe a little bit posteriorly and get on the ulna. And what you'll see, and turn on your Doppler, you'll see this little perforating arterial. Once you see that pulsation, you know you're getting close to the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So this is the ulna, this is uh, the radius, the, the, uh, the proximal radius, radial head. And if you rotate your probe, here's radial head, and this is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament going down into the ulna. Again, just another structure that's helpful to identify on ultrasound, but just knowing these little subtle turns of the probe can be very helpful. And again, not having, doing our hands-on demonstration, it's somewhat difficult to demonstrate that to you just based on the PowerPoint presentation. So the last uh, lateral structure we're gonna talk about here is the radial nerve. And I think we're familiar that the radial nerve uh, comes down through between the brachialis and the brachioradialis, and then it divides into the deep and superficial radial nerve the deep branch will actually divide or uh, dive into the two heads of the supinator at the arcade of Froch, and then it'll penetrate out the other side as the posterior neurosseous nerve, and it will innervate our dorsal forearm musculature. The superficial branch, as you're aware, will follow with the brachioradialis. So if you're lost and you can't find the superficial radial nerve, either go up and find it at its division or try to find the brachioradialis. It'll follow the brachioradialis down the distal radial portion of the forearm. 
Now, here's the orientation of what our probe would look like. Uh, we're going to identify this typical fascicular picture of the radial nerve sitting between the brachialis and the brachial radialis. And as I play this video, you actually see the radial nerve divide. And this is the two heads of the supinator where that radial nerve will divide. You see it branching off and diving. And you can follow this nerve through the supinator and it will continue out the uh, uh, dorsal radial side of the forearm to innervate all the deep forearm muscles. The superficial nerve, uh, radial nerve will be here and all follow down the forearm with the brachial radial. So again, nice uh, way to identify the radial nerve. Now here's an example of a woman. This was a work comp here in the United States. If you get injured on the job, it's a separate insurance plan. And this was a worker who four months prior to seeing us um, was picking up she was a cashier and she was picking up a bag and felt pain, much like tennis elbow pain, I guess, common extensor origin pain. But she then developed a wrist drop and finger drop. She could not extend her wrist, had no paresthesias, had no neck pain. And she was referred four months afterwards for an EMG. And her EMG showed classic denervation of the radial innervated muscles below the level of the tricep. And this to me looked like a classic radial neuropathy, but her story was interesting that it came on fairly suddenly. So this is a short axis view of the radial nerve. Her radial nerve is right here. And you can see this intraneural cyst with some septi that's actually coming off the radial nerve. It's fairly large. This is a video I'll show you as I play this. Um, fairly contiguous with the radial nerve, the deep branch of the radial nerve. And so I talked it over with our hand surgeon and he wanted nothing to do with this. He's like, you know, I, I, the surgeons tell me that the radial nerve is very susceptible to any trauma, both from compression as we know, but also intraoperatively. So he felt it would be best to try to treat her conservatively. And we numbed her up really well and took an 18 gauge needle and uh, stuck it into the epineurum or through the epineurum and sucked out clear yellow gel and decompress this and actually put a little bit of corticosteroid around the nerve, not into the nerve, but around it. And about six weeks later, she was starting to recover hand function. Her pain was better. Uh, and she actually was able to get back to work in about four months after this. Now scanning this later, she still had some cystic remnants of this. Uh, we did not send anything for biopsy because the only thing I got was uh, fluid out of it. But this looked like a typical intraneural uh, cystic structure and did not necess necessitate surgery. The last structure just to highlight here is the annular ligament. Clinically not too relevant in the adult population, more significant for nurse maid's elbow. Um, you want to scan in short axis over the radial head, but you'll see a long axis view of the annular ligament and you can pronate and supinate might help you identify over the uh, proximal radius to, to identify this annular structure. Now you're not going to typically see the annular recess. They're not a common place that we look for uh, joint fluid in this particular case. So that summarizes this talk and basically tried to go over a systematic approach to different quadrants of the elbow and looking at different clinical features and pearls. We talked about all the views that are out there for the biceps. Try to get adept at one or two of these and I think that will help serve you well when you're looking for biceps pathology but understand there's two different heads of the biceps distally. And we know, showing you a couple of cases here, that nerve injury is really nice about the elbow, that you can look for subluxation as well as masses and other structures uh, that can be causing nerve pathology about the elbow joint. Your medial lateral epicondyles, obviously that's your bread and butter, but remember your radial collateral ligament can portend an unfavorable prognosis for patients with tennis elbow. And then if you're looking for an effusion or doing an injection, look posteriorly, that's the best place to guide your injection. And then dynamic maneuvers for your ulnar nerve, ulnar collateral ligament, biceps, tendon, always helpful when we're talking about ultrasound at the elbow. And with that, again, I'd like to thank you all and Dr. DeCastro for having me. It's quite humbling and uh, intimidating at the same time, but I, I thank you for all paying attention. It's a great lecture, Dr. Paul. I, I don't think you were intimidated at all. That was really an excellent lecture. <laughs> Very nice and uh, very uh, important structures that uh, a lot of us would like to see. Uh, you have shown it very well with all the pathologies and uh, the very pertinent uh, findings that we see, uh, especially those uh, dynamic imaging. So we'd like to thank you. And uh, I would like to ask if there's any question from our attendees uh, uh, today. Uh, I think, uh, this was a very comprehensive one. We, we basically cover everything. 
And uh, well, uh, I just have to uh, ask one question, Dr. Paul, if you don't mind. Uh, how often do you see uh, pronator teres syndrome? Because sometimes in my experience, uh, rare, there, there's, there, there are some um, uh, cases in the patient where the deep layer of the pronator teres is uh, not very much visible. And, uh, and when I try to scan it, uh, it looks like it's being compressed between your uh, pronator teres and your brachialis. How, how do you, how do you uh, say that? I, I agree 100%. I don't think, maybe it's seeing me, but I have not seen it. Uh, I think that in everyone, as you scan the median nerve, to me, it has a very oblique and quick turn around the pronator once it goes into the forearm between the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. And it's quite challenging to see it make that dive. I, I think when I'm teaching this, the point I try to make out is that the anatomy in that area can be a little bit tricky because you have the brachialis and you, have a, you can have variable anatomy of the pronator teres. So just making sure you distinguish between what's pronator teres and what's brachialis can be tricky. But clinically and uh, electrodiagnostically, I'm not so sure I've seen a case of pronator teres. And I've asked my hand surgeon, our hand surgeon sees 30 to 35 patients a day and I've asked him if he's ever seen a case of pronator teres, and he is not. So it's reported, um, and unfortunately, it's certainly nowhere near the other causes of median neuropathy that we see in the forearm or in the, in the hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Uh, I have another question, actually, about the ulnar nerve. Uh, do you, uh, of course, we, we know about the double cross syndrome in, uh, in, in, in median nerve where you have... Uh, a neck problem together with uh, with the hand, but they also see this as a as a as a problem with ulnar nerve, where patients would present with weakness of the fourth and fifth finger, but uh, you don't quite see any abnormality in the ulnar nerve, no subluxation, but uh, maybe there could be a some kind of a double crash thing. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the, the CAT1 distribution dermatomaly, uh, I find, like, oftentimes, as I said, I see a lot of patients with ulnar-sided hand symptoms or medial forearm paresthesias, weakness, and they come in and are, they're referred from either our spine surgeon or our hand surgeon, and their electrodiagnostic studies might look relatively benign. I think those are cases of patients who may have some adverse neural tension, whether they have a little TOS-type stuff going on. And, you know, I usually ask them about what job they have, what's their career, do they sit at a computer a lot. So where I see cases of where I'm really scratching my head that a person has a lot of ulnar neuropathy symptomatology but does not seem to have pathology, that's the person I really kind of stress more of the, the therapy and stretching and ulnar, uh, uh, a lot of scalene, pectoralis minor, TOS type cases. And just asking them what they do day to day. Do they sleep with their elbows flexed? Do they sit at a computer desk and as I'm doing, leaning on my elbows and sitting with very poor posture all day for 10 hours a day. Those are the things that we start with to try to address first. But I agree with you 100%. Not, not, it's hard sometimes you don't see very much. And, and along that line, I'll see cases of patients who are diagnosed uh, electromyographically with cubital tunnel as they have a significant drop. Now, I know there can be errors with measuring across the elbow and things like that, but people will come in who are you know, coming in for more median nerve type symptoms and they have drop across the ulnar nerve across the elbow. And I'm like, geez, they're not even here for that, but they have electrodiagnostic criteria for that. So it, it's not a perfect world, certainly. Yeah. Okay, Pash, uh, you have a question. Go ahead. Thank you very Hello. much. Yeah. Thank Pash. you very much, doctor, for that very comprehensive lecture. You didn't I agree with Dr. Jim. You didn't seem intimidated at all. <laughs> so thank you very much. Anyway, doctor, when we do like, um, if you want to do injections on the posterior, uh, you know, compartments of the elbow, can you give us like any tips how we would position the patient for more comfort and better visualization? Thank you. Yeah. So for my, uh, for my elbow injection, elbow joint, I prefer doing them prone and I'll lay them prone kind of like they're like this. So they're laying down. I usually have them head, their head turned to the other side. So they can't see. So I'm let, they're laying over the table. And then what I do is I go from the lateral 
side of the elbow where there's nothing in play here. The radial nerve is too anterior. Um, and I go from lateral um, posterior to anterior. And I, I use a somewhat of oblique approach, but I'm just using the needle down to touch the uh, medial aspect of the posterior medial ep epicondyle. And once the needle's in the fat, that's an intraarticular injection. I can instill whatever I, I, I need to, whether it's steroid or, or whatever. For um, other posterior injection, like the um, uh, distal biceps tendon or bicipital radial bursa, I think doing the same type of approach would be advantageous as well, laying them prone and then just making sure that you're situated in a chair at an angle that you can see both the screen and the, um, the, the tendon in that view using that um, COBRA approach as I had discussed. Dr. Jean, you're in mute. Uh, any follow-up question? No more question. Okay, Dr. Paul, we really thank you for your time. I know you have a clinic coming up uh, in a few minutes. <laughs> so we, we don't want to hold you any longer. We just would like to thank you for your time and your uh, effort to attend our Zoom meeting today. And uh, I hope you enjoy our company and uh, hopefully we can see you again. We can invite you again next time, Dr. Paul. <laughs> I, would, I thank you for the opportunity. I'm humbled and quite intimidated. And it's wonderful uh, that uh, unfortunately in such bad circumstances that at least we can share some knowledge and, and talk and see some wonderful faces out there and smiling faces. So please uh, stay healthy, everyone. God bless. Um, and hopefully we can get together soon. Yeah, thank you. And God bless. Uh, and... Uh, Hopefully we can uh, really see, we're, we're not going to San Diego this year. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, very restrictive travel uh, in, in this part of the world and also maybe in your country. So yeah. thank you, Dr. Paul. And uh, uh, Dr. Ray Matias is sending his regards to you. And also, no, you still remember them, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Big Yuk Tan, you, you, you still know him, right? Yeah, it's a, it, it was a whirlwind tour of the Philippines, but I love it. I tell people that all the time. The people and the food and the places, just everything about it is a great, great country. Yeah, so uh, they're sending their regards to you. Thank you very much. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to post your lecture in our YouTube channel. Would that be all right with you? Sure. Okay, thank you very much because... Uh, a lot of our colleagues are, are saying that uh, it might, they might not be able to come, but they would like to view it there. So thank you very much again for your generosity, for your time and uh, all your expertise that you have shared with us. Well, thank you. Thank you to all. Be safe and hopefully we see you soon. Yes, be safe and God bless. Okay, God bless to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.